Talking with the experts. In episode 565, Discover Jet Ron Wake's insights on building a seven figure freelance business while prioritizing mental health. So it's called conformity or conformism, which means that we will agree with what a larger group says in order to survive, right? So if we look at back in the day, that could mean, you know, if there's two caves, let's say we were cavemen and one person goes into the left one and comes back with fruit and happy and he has a smile on his face and someone goes into the right cave and they come out with a missing arm or maybe people don't come back okay most of us would choose the left cave you know um out of survival or if a whole group decides to migrate somewhere you know we would travel in a pack we would go together it would be rarely that we go off on our own because we have less chances to survive now this is called conformity and it also happens uh, all around us everywhere so maybe think of yourself when you were in a classroom with a teacher and they asked you a question to raise your hand did you really raise your hand because it was your opinion or because everyone was raising? Talking with the experts. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello, welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from TalkingWithTheExperts.com. Talking with the Experts is all about business by business owners for business owners. You can find it on all good podcasting, streaming platforms, and on YouTube. And today my guest is Jet Von Wake. And um, Jet's going to be talking to us about social media, mental health, and building a seven-figure freelancing business. Now, Jet is originally from um, the Netherlands and is a multi-seven-figure entrepreneur and business coach who specializes in digital marketing and online businesses. She is the founder of the Freelance Academy Lap- Laptop Lifestyle Master and the digital marketing agency JVW. Before transitioning into business coaching, Jet was an influencer and a digital marketer. Uh, her experience in these fields led her to create her digital marketing agency and develop online courses to guide others uh, out of traditional nine to five roles. And um, you know, I really love the topic about you know social media and mental health because um, it's been in the in the headlines lately. And so, Jet, welcome to talking with the experts. I'm really looking forward to getting your insights on on the topic today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So, um, tell me a little bit about why social media and mental health are you know such hot topics at the moment. Yeah, I think it's more and more coming to light what it actually does with us, right? The phone, social media, being on platforms like Instagram, um, and obviously the the people using these apps and phones are getting younger and younger too. And I feel like now, after a few years, we're really seeing now the effects that it has on people's mental health, on how they also, you know, uh, behave in society, how it changes them in a way. Um, and personally, I'm really interested on, on what, you know, the science is behind it, like what it actually does to our brain. Um, but I feel more and more people and professionals are speaking up about it and yeah, helping us all navigate social media in a more healthy way, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you're right. You know, the, the, um, the users of social media are getting younger and younger and, you know, um, I, I don't know, a lot of us seem to spend a lot of time just scrolling through social media and it's really a mindless um, endeavor. Um, you know, you're not using your brain so so uh, um, as much as you would be if you're reading a book, for instance. But anyway, getting off that and getting off the political sort of roundabout about <laughs> social media and, and young users, how can we build a successful, uh, f- especially freelance business, um, while maintaining a personal well-being and and avoiding all those social media pressures. Yeah, that's a good question. I 
I believe the first step is making sure that you really love also the industry you're going to freelance in. That's going to help a lot, you know, for your mental health, for how you feel about working and work will feel less like work. So I think it's important to really dive deep into what do you actually like doing, you know, and you can discover this by asking questions such as what did you like doing as a kid? Um, what are your passions? If you are scrolling on platforms like Pinterest, like what are the things that make you excited to see, you know, what type of content are you consuming? Uh, and then we can look at, okay, are there certain niches and industries that can relate to these interests and hobbies and passions you have? And then, of course, it's important to research that it's somewhat profitable and in-demand industries as well to work in. But I think that is important not to just start a freelance business um, in an industry that you don't actually like, because you will just create another nine to five for yourself. So that is very important. And then how can we do it in a way that, you know, doesn't affect our mental health as much? I believe that is, again, by making sure that the things you are doing to grow your business are also aligning with what you, you know, deep down actually enjoy. So if you do enjoy being creative and writing or creating content, you should totally market your business on social media, 100%, because it is a place where, you know, nowadays everyone is looking for freelancers as well, and they're looking to hire people. Um, however, there's different ways to go about it. So instead of being super hyper-focused on how many likes am I getting, how many comments am I getting, or am I getting followers, just focus on literally the thing I mentioned, that you like what you are doing. So creating, and I actually say document over creating. So just document your journey, document your life as a freelancer, document how you're helping clients, and don't hyper-focus so much on what I call vanity metrics, because having a lot of followers, having a lot of likes doesn't necessarily mean that those are your clients. It just means you are good at capturing attention, which is, you know, it's, it's great, but you can be a super successful business owner with, you know, a hundred followers. And some people with hundred followers, they make way more money than someone with hundred K followers if they don't know how to capitalize on the audience. Um, so I do believe it is having that mindset that it is more quality over quantity in any business for, for that matter. Um, and yeah, not focusing so much on necessarily um, getting a lot of likes or followers, but more, okay, do I feel aligned with what I'm putting out? Am I giving value to my ideal customer? Uh, and are we attracting the right people? And I think if you focus on that, it can be a lot less toxic than focusing too much on, I want to be the the person who has 100k followers and yeah uh, kind of chasing the yeah. wrong thing i guess yeah you're right yeah. about the vanity matrix you know um you know we we told constantly that we need to have you know all the likes all the followers um mm -hmm. you know to have people interacting with our with our social media uh, presence however you, again you are right that they may not be your ideal customer yeah so how can we use um you know these metrics or or increase our metrics to um, gain those people that we're actually looking for? I believe it's by being very specific. That's, that's the first part, very specific on who you want to work with. Um, and then really doing a lot of research in exactly where these people hang out, what do they like, what are they attracted to? So really putting yourself in the shoes of your ideal customer avatar and looking at what do they engage with, what type of content do they consume, and then creating things, again, that align with your values and what you want to uh, offer and serve. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of research, actually. I call that viral hacking. So you can actually um, find content that performed well in the niche that you're in, and you can literally viral hack their videos and use similar hooks, use similar approaches in the video. Uh, and that will make sure that you get in front of the right audience. What also helps a lot is determining what are your content pillars. So for any business, right? Any business owner, um, I recommend around three content pillars. I know some people say three to five, but I feel like it gets very overwhelming when you go over three. It's too many topics to think about, you know? So I would stick to three content pillars uh, of what, you know, 
you want to share with the world and that aligns with your customer avatar. And then based on these three content pillars, you're going to make a content plan and you're going to research what performs well right now in your niche. Uh, and by sticking to that, you make sure that, you know, you're always doing something that could bring you to these new customers that you would like to attract, um, but that it stays aligned with, you know, your offer and the service that you're offering. Because what happens a lot, and especially if for your business as a any business owner, freelancer, you're scrolling on social media. So you will see so many random videos and things. And it is so easy to think, oh, that went viral. Maybe I should recreate that. But if you actually look at your content pillars, does it actually make sense in, in what you offer in your page, in your business? Or is it kind of shiny object syndrome that you just saw a funny video or a viral video? You feel like you also want to go viral. So now you're making something that doesn't align at all <laughs> with your page. And that is how you quickly can really get, you know, you, you lose track, obviously, of uh, attracting the right people. And that's when you are focusing more on attracting just a lot of random people. So, yeah, it's uh, it's sticking yeah, to your totally content pillars. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. The whole concept of that and you know and being authentic is is really mm -hmm. really important and you know don't don't do and follow be a sheep and follow everybody else's you know because it might not be yeah. right for you as an individual um mm -hmm. to do what someone else is doing although you know viral hacking is is you know a legitimate practice but yeah. you know don't but find your own your own way of doing things and and don't you know just follow the trend because in the end, the you know, customers are going to find out that it's not you, and, and mm -hmm. then you're not you're not being honest and authentic with them. Yeah, I think it's a balance, you know. Um, I do believe that um, it makes sense to follow what works. So I have this big belief that you know every effect, desirable effect, had a specific cause, and. There's a recipe that got them to a certain point or that got them a certain result or that attracted the right customers. And then I do believe that it makes sense to follow such recipe um, to try and get a similar result. But it's definitely true. You should stay authentic. And again, make sure you listen to your intuition and ask yourself, is this really me? And also, does it align with what obviously my goals are uh, of this business? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it's important that you, uh, yeah, you stay honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really important. I think. I think that's probably one of the yeah. most important things about the whole process of being on social media. And you know, there are a lot of psychological effects of being on social media, and you know, um, these effects can you know impact on our mental health and our strategies for staying authentic in the in it in the digital age. How can we? use strategies to overcome you know these these effects and 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 uh, you know stay authentic yeah so from i think the most important part is actually acknowledging and understanding what's happening at least for me i'm the person that as soon as i understand the science or biology or reasoning behind why something is happening it's easier for me to disarm it and to go against it, right? So I feel like that is a big part, like being educated about it. So if we look at a, a bigger picture, let's say, what is happening on social media is something that deep down is already in our survival instinct. So it's called conformity or conformism, which means that we will agree with what a larger group says in order to survive, right? So if we look at back in the day, that could mean, you know, if there's two caves, let's say we were cavemen and one person goes into the left one and comes back with fruit and happy and he has a smile on his face and someone goes into the right cave and they come out with a missing arm or maybe people don't come back. Okay, most of us would choose the left cave, you know, um, out of survival or if a whole group decides to migrate somewhere you know, we would travel in a pack, we would go together. It would be rarely that we go off on our own because we have less chances to survive. Now, this is called conformity, and it also happens uh, all around us, everywhere. So maybe think of yourself when you were in a classroom with a teacher and they asked you a question to raise your hand. 
did you really raise your hand because it was your opinion or because everyone was raising their hand? This is conformity. So we try to agree with what the majority says because we think we have more chances to survive or to have it correct. Now, when we didn't have social media or phones, that happened in our communities with the people that we were seeing, right? In our town, in our village. This is also how social norms uh, and certain rules actually uh, started because majority agreed with something and started to, you know, model after this. Now on social media, we have such a big reach that this happens on a very large scale. And what that looks like is, for example, yeah, if a specific video of someone doing something or someone looking a certain way gets a lot of likes and followers and comments, it often gets perceived as something good something to copy, something to follow, because the attention goes there. Um, and this is how, for example, we have very interesting beauty standards nowadays, because people like Kim Kardashian and, you know, Kylie Jenner, they get so much attention that a lot of the women feel they have to be like that, because all the people vote that this is something desirable. It's something that gets likes, it gets attention. Um, so, if we understand actually that this is happening to us and in a way it's almost in our subconscious, you might not even realize this is happening, but you're constantly changing your opinion by seeing what gets the most likes. And there have been many studies about this where they had two products, identical products, but the product that had the most likes always got chosen as the best one with social media likes, right? Um, so it is, it's two things. It is, we are changing our opinion based on whether it's liked a lot by others, which then kind of changes what we actually think deep down. <laughs> um, so it's, that's kind of, you know, uh, let's say, yeah, I would say a, a mind spiral almost where it is important to understand that. And how that translated for me was, when I was an influencer and I started with beautiful travel landscapes and posting travel blogs and tips and all of that, slowly I kept choosing to continue with the content that performed the best. That we ended up where it was always photos of me, you know, or looking very attractive, even in bikinis on the beach, because that got the most likes and followers. But if I look back at how I started, <laughs> this whole trajectory of where it went was kind of subconscious because what I did was I looked at what performed the best. So I actually started doing what my audience liked and not what I liked. And that is also why I say, you know, what is an influencer? Because in a way, our audience is influencing us to change who we are so that we get liked more. So yeah, understanding this, I think is the first point and doing research about it into disarming it because now being having this knowledge and for myself, I've done a lot of neuroscience research. I've, I've had discussion with neuroscientists about this topic. Understanding really the deeper research for me has allowed me to say, I'm just gonna post and I really don't care if it gets likes, if it doesn't get likes. I'm going to stay authentic to who I am. And if I see something and it triggers me, it triggers me into thinking about comparison or maybe it triggers me into thinking that I'm not good enough. I can hold myself for a second and be like, hey, why is this happening? Okay, it's because of this. So, you know, you can choose to go against conformity. And that is why with the cave example, you know, um, someone with a strong mind someone who understands conformity, maybe who looks for opportunities in risks or opportunities in being different, like an entrepreneur, we might still go into the cave where a guy came out losing his arm because we're like, let's see what happens. Maybe, you know, I can be different. So I do think it is possible to be different, but with how social media is programmed and the algorithms and the speed of how things go, it is more difficult than ever to be different and to mm. keep your own thoughts and to stay authentic to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. No, I yeah. couldn't agree more. I'm certainly not a conformist. I, um, yeah. <laughs> I just put social media out there, post some things out there, and you know, and um, if it gets likes and and 
I mean, I'm I'm more interested in the amount that my posts are being shared um, mm. rather than the amount of likes that it gets. I think because if someone's sharing my content, then they think it's worthy of passing on to somebody else who might be interested. Yeah. So, And that's how we get clients is by passing on or sharing social media mm-hmm. posts, I believe. Yeah, totally. <laughs> now, there are some proven methods that uh, that can create financial freedom through high ticket freelancing and and digital marketing. Um, Jet, I'd really love your take on some of those proven methods. If you'd like to share those with us, please. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I believe that freelancing is still so in demand, you know, and, and let's break that down as well. What, what, what do we mean with freelancing, right? Because it's a bit of a broad, let's say, uh, topic. So what I'm talking about is marketing freelancer. So someone who gets hired online for specific digital marketing service. So this can be social media management, copywriting, email marketing, running ads for someone, AI. It is all these digital skills that we can then transfer into services that business owners all over the world obviously need very much nowadays. Um, So there's still really high demand in obviously needing freelancers because there's so many businesses that all need marketing. Um, And I believe one of the most important aspects to getting high paying clients. So uh, I'm talking about 1K plus packages, you know, as a freelancer is definitely by standing out. So it's by positioning yourself in a way that you are delivering a quality service, that you are very catered to a specific niche. And I always use this example, you know, if, um, if I'm looking to hire someone, Would I hire someone who says, I can build funnels, social media, I can do email marketing for coaches, doctors, coffee shops, restaurants, and uh, surfboard shops? Or would I hire someone who says, I'm a social media manager for female coaches? I would go for social media manager for female coaches who has experience in my niche with similar businesses to myself. So being specific already puts you in my opinion, in a higher bracket where you can charge more. Being very specific to who you market to, who your clients are, uh, already gives you more leverage there. Now, secondly, personally, if I'm hiring someone um, and they tell me, okay, Jet, I can manage your social media for $500 a month. I probably don't want it because I don't think it's going to be any good. (laughs) This is like, hey, I have a Ferrari. It's $50. Do you want it? Probably not because it's going to blow up in my face as soon as I step foot into it, you know? Um, So this is another, I guess, misconception that a lot of people have that pricing yourself less is going to give you some competitive advantage, but it doesn't. It It makes you sound cheap or unreliable and not professional. You have to charge what makes sense. Uh, and if you are really good at what you do, so this is after years of really mastering the skill, having case studies, proven results, then you are also pricing yourself higher because of the results you get a business. But already from the start, even as a completely new freelancer, you should charge what it's worth your time, learning the skill, and obviously how much time you're saving the business owner, how much money you're gonna bring them in, that you already should charge that even as a new freelancer, right? Um, And then obviously the more you build your skills, then you can also up-level your prices and your packaging because you have all of these results and case studies backed up. So that's the two things. It's how you position yourself. So that means a very specific niche, doing all your branding, all your marketing, very specific to that niche. And then secondly, is how you price yourself and the value you bring to the business. So an example, (laughs) if you love and you think, oh, I would love to learn augmented reality and how to develop AR models. And you choose a niche now, like farmer's markets. This offer doesn't really make sense. Farmer's markets do not necessarily need right now augmented reality, you know? (laughs) I mean, I don't say you can't sell it. It's just not a no-brainer offer. What's a no-brainer offer is SEO for local farmer's markets so that they rank high in Google, so that they're visible, so that people go to them, you know? So it is 
these two things hand in hand, you have to pick a niche that you're passionate about, that you love, right? What we talked about. So you actually enjoy working in it. And then when you're going to offer a service, it also has to make sense for that niche. It has to be something that they really need specifically. So even for myself, I'm more in the online space. I'm an online coach. I have online courses, e-learning, agency. So SEO could be something I want, but it's not the first thing I need. <laughs> you know, the first thing I need is more ads. It's something that gets me results quicker online. Uh, I don't have a physical business. So Google Maps, SEO, all of that is not so important to me. And also because I am in the online space, um, there's so much competition for keywords like working online, courses. So this is not for me a no-brainer offer. I would hear that and be like, yeah, probably good, but you know, but something like I'm going to build you funnels that's going to convert X, Y, Z, or I'm going to make you email campaigns that are going to double your, your uh, sales, right? Okay, that is stuff I'm like, yeah, I'm already making money there. So if I get someone who's good, who knows their stuff, I can make more money, right? So it's researching as well in the niche that you like to work in, what do they actually need? What is something that they're already making money with that you can just amplify? And then you're an asset to a business from the start. Yeah. Wonderful advice. My goodness, <laughs> I think, you know, um, I think for anyone who's starting out and wants to be a freelancer, I think what Jed has just shared with us is absolutely brilliant. And and uh, yeah, and you're right. Don't undervalue yourself. Don't underprice mm -hmm. yourself first starting out. That is so so important. I I did that when I first started offering my services um, as a podcast coach, and I you know I thought no one's going to pay what what um, what I thought was. Uh, I was actually worse. I thought I just cut it, undercut it a bit, and and no one, um, you know, took me up on it because it, to them it was too cheap. Um, yeah. And cheap is not necessarily good, and but cheap, you know, don't get me wrong, cheap can be good, or the less expensive thing can be good, but it's not always in the mind of your of your clients or customers. So you know, put your prices where they are. Um, reminiscent of the value that you can bring to that particular client or to that particular market. I think that's really, really important. And, and as um, anyone starting out, there is really great advice to don't undervalue yourself ever. Totally, definitely. Yeah, and it's also, if we charge less, then we can also not dedicate as much time and quality to, to that specific client. Um, it's the same for, you know, we have, in, in our company, we have different layers of information. So we have eBooks, we have a self-paced course, we have coaching, we have a mastermind. And essentially it is all the same information, but what you are paying for is the guidance and the people behind it. So of course, like going through a self-paced course, we made it once and you're benefiting from the information, but actually getting coaching and having people uh, answer your questions and hop on calls with them. That is all intensive labor that goes into it. So of course you would charge more. If I would charge less, it would probably not be good as well, because then how can I pay the people that are supporting that product? And I think it's the same for any business. You are not just charging for that one instance or this one service. You're actually charging for all the time it took you to learn it. And then also all the care and the delivery that goes into it. Um, and that's important as well to, yeah, to take into account when setting up your packages. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, and having different layers of offers, as you've suggested, is is a great way to, you know, get those clients because people will um, put as much effort into uh, what they purchase is is. Uh, according to the price that they pay. So anyone that's, yeah. you know, you're offering something for free, a free service, well, people aren't going to show up, are they? I mean, in my yeah. mind anyway, um, because it's free, so they don't care. But if, you know, if they have to pay for something, they're going to put the amount of effort um, equal to the amount that they've paid for that particular service or product even. Um, yeah. So, you know, don't, um, you know, don't think that, again, that the less expensive is the best way to go, especially when mm -hmm. if you're, client looking for something just because someone's offering you something for $97 doesn't mean that you're going to um, get 
bad service. It's just that you're not going to get the same quality as if you were paying $197. So Exactly, definitely. And I, I feel with freelancers, a good one as well is I often hear my students also ask this question of, Jet, someone asked me to do a test sample or to do a project to test for free. Like, should I do it? And personally, I mean, if you're starting out, okay, you can consider it. But personally, I believe you shouldn't. I think you should charge for that already to show that what you are delivering is always going to be quality. Or you should obviously share with them previous work that you already did with other clients. You can say, hey, I'm unfortunately not able to do free work, um, but here is portfolio example that I did with XYZ client. It's a similar because of this and this. If you would like me to go ahead uh, and actually make one week worth of content, this is what I would charge for it. You know, yeah, uh, and just be very clear about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and it is it is great to be clear in the at the onset of you know when you're um, you know speaking to a potential client customer yeah. that uh, you know that there is a cost involved in that uh, you know you don't you don't value yourself if you're offering free services to everybody yeah totally totally yeah now if you want to find jet you can find her on um she on facebook she's on linkedin uh, she has a website which is um j-e-t-v-a-n-w-i-j-k dot uh, com uh, she's on Instagram and she's on YouTube and you have mm -hmm. a master program um, that you're offering as a as a promotion to our listeners today. Can you tell us a little bit, Jed, about what's involved in that master program and, and how they can actually um, find out about it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So one of my flagship programs is really helping people to go from either complete newbies to finding their niche and their passion, linking it to the services and setting up their whole freelance business to then land clients. Uh, we do this in 90 days. It is also for existing freelancers who are struggling with, you know, how to position themselves and how to attract really those high ticket clients to redo their fundamentals so that they can also land high ticket clients. And yeah, it's a three month program. It is very in-depth coaching. So there will be workshops, Q and A's, expert calls, an amazing community as well. Um, we have it in Discord where you can literally, I mean, I've been in a lot of courses where you have this dead Facebook group <laughs> where nothing really happens, but because our community is in Discord, it's like such a vibrant, chatty community where everyone is supporting each other. They're role-playing together, accountability partners. Like it's it's really an amazing community to be a part of. Um, and yeah, in, in as short as 90 days, you could be able to already land, you know, your first high ticket client. Um, and yeah, this is the Laptop Lifestyle Master Program. That's the name. Yeah. Wonderful, Jet. Now all those links will be in the show notes when this goes to uh, when it gets put up onto YouTube and to SoundCloud. Jimmy, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for sharing all that wonderful knowledge with us. I've, I've even learned a little bit today, so um, <laughs> it's always a highlight to any of my episodes is when I can awesome. learn something from my guests. So you take care, mm -hmm. and, and I will be uh, talking to you again very soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye for now. Okay. You've been listening to Talking with the Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time.